Welcome to Sleepy Eyes. I am your host, Varga. I take you on a journey in the dark of the night with warm tales. Take a moment to relax your body and mind with the current calmness. Breathe deeply, feel the energy inside, and let go of any tiredness. Put aside the past and focus on the peacefulness of the present moment. Recognize any tension in your body. Allow it to fade away and unwind. Discover your inner peace and simply unwind in the tranquility of now. Before going to sleep, prepare to read a story comfortably in this peaceful setting. Let the magic of words captivate you as you get lost in a tale or story. With the warmth from this peace and relaxation, your sleep will become even more serene. Close your eyes, embark on a journey with a touch of words. Let each word guide you a bit deeper toward the essence of your inner peace. Now, relax and enjoy the pleasure of getting lost in the enchanting world of the story before drifting into sleep. Sherlock Holmes Short Stories Writer Sir Arthur Conan Doyle The Engineer's Thumb Part 3 I do not know how long I remained unconscious. It must have been a very long time, as it was daybreak when I woke up. My clothes were wet through, and my coat was covered in blood from my wounded hand. The pain reminded me of all the details of my midnight adventure, and I jumped to my feet with the feeling that even now I might not be safe from my enemies. But, to my surprise, when I looked about me, I could see neither the house nor the garden. I had been lying near the side of a country road, and not far off I saw a long, low building. I walked along towards this, and found that it was the railway station where I had arrived the night before. Except for the wound on my hand, everything that had happened during those terrible hours might have been a dream. Still only half conscious, I went into the station and asked about the morning train. There would be one to Reading in less than an hour. The same railway man was on duty as at the time of my arrival. I asked him whether he had ever heard of Captain Lysander Stark. The name was not familiar to him. Had he noticed a carriage waiting for me the night before? No, he had not. Was there a police station anywhere near? There was one two or three miles away. It was too far for me to go in my weak state. I decided to wait until I got back to London before telling my story to the police. It was about half past six when I arrived, and I went first to have my wound bandaged. After that, the doctor very kindly brought me along here. I should like to put the case into your hands, and will do exactly what you advise. Sherlock Holmes and I sat in silence for some moments after listening to this strange account. Then Holmes pulled down from a shelf one of the thick, heavy books in which it was his habit to stick pieces from the newspapers. Here is an advertisement that will interest you, he said. It appeared in all the papers about a year ago. Listen to this. Lost on the ninth of this month, Mr. Jeremiah Haling, 26 years old, an engineer. He left his rooms at 10 o'clock at night and has not been heard of since. He was dressed in... and so on. Yes, that must have been the last time the captain needed to have his press repaired, I think. Good heavens, cried my patient. Then that explains what the woman said. I have no doubt of it, said Holmes. It is quite clear that the captain is a determined man who would not allow anything or anybody to stand in his way. Well, every moment is important, and so, if you feel strong enough, Mr. Hatherley, we will go to Scotland Yard and then to Aford. Two hours later, we were all in the train together, on our way from Reading to the little Berkshire village. There were Sherlock Holmes, Mr. Hatherley the engineer, Bradstreet the Scotland Yard detective, a young policeman, and myself. Bradstreet had spread a large-scale map of the Eiford area out on the seat and was drawing a circle with Eiford at its center. There, he said, 
that circle is 20 miles across, 10 miles from a ford in every direction. The place we want must be somewhere near that line. You said 10 miles, I think, sir? The drive took more than an hour, said Mr. Hatherley. And you think that they brought you back all that way while you were unconscious? They must have done so. I have a confused memory, too, of having been lifted and carried somewhere. I can't understand why they didn't kill you when they found you in the garden, I said. Perhaps the woman begged Stark to let you go, and succeeded in softening him. I don't think that very likely. Hatherley and Swear, I never saw a more cruel face than his in my life. Oh, we shall soon find an explanation for all that, said Bradstreet. Well... I have drawn my circle, but I wish I knew at which point on it the wanted men are to be found. I think I could put my finger on the right point, said Holmes quietly. Really? cried Bradstreet. So you have formed your opinion? Well, then, we shall see who agrees with you. I say it is to the south, as there are very few houses in that direction. And I say east, said Hatherley. I think it is to the west, said the second policeman. There are several quiet little villages up there. And I think it is to the north, I said, because there are no hills there, and Mr. Hatherley says that he did not notice the carriage going up any. Bradstreet laughed, so we have opinions for north, south, east, and west. Which do you agree with, Mr. Holmes? I don't agree with any of them, Holmes answered but we can't all be wrong. Oh yes, you can. This is my point, he said, placing his finger on the center of the circle. This is where we shall find them. But how do you explain the ten-mile drive? Asked Hatherley in surprise. Five miles out and five back. Nothing could be simpler. You said yourself that the horse was quite fresh when you got in. That would be completely impossible if the horse had just gone ten miles over rough roads. Yes, said Bradstreet thoughtfully. It's quite a likely explanation. Of course, it is not difficult to guess what kind of men these are. Yes, said Holmes. They are forgers of coins on a large scale. The presses used to form the mixture with which they make a metal that looks like silver. We have known for some time that a clever group was at work, said Bradstreet. They have made many thousands of forged silver coins. We even had clues, which led to Reading, but we could get no further. They had covered their tracks too cleverly, but now I think they are about to fall into our hands. But Bradstreet was mistaken. Those criminals never fell into the hands of the police. As our train came into Aford Station, we saw a broad line of smoke rising into the air behind some trees in the neighborhood of the village. Is there a house on fire? Bradstreet asked as soon as we had got out. Yes, sir, said the station master. When did the fire break out? I hear that it was during the night, sir, but it has got worse, and by now the house is almost completely destroyed. Whose house is it? Dr. Becker's. Tell me. Hatherley interrupted. Is Dr. Betcher a German? Very thin, with a long, sharp nose. The station master laughed loudly. No, sir, Dr. Betcher is an Englishman, and he's the fattest man in the village, but he has a gentleman staying with him, one of his patients, I believe, who is a foreigner, and he is extremely thin. The station master had not finished speaking before we were all hurrying in the direction of the fire. In front of us on a low hill, there was a large white house. Smoke and flames were coming out of every window, while in the garden in front three fire engines were attempting, with little success, to control the fire. That's the house, cried Hatherley in great excitement. There are the bushes where I lay and that second window is the one that I jumped from. Well, at least, said Holmes, you have had your revenge on them. I have no doubt that it was your oil lamp which, when it was crushed in the press, set fire to the wooden walls, though no doubt Stark and Ferguson were too excited by their hunt for you to notice it at the time. Now keep your eyes open in this crowd for those two men, though I fear that by now they are almost at the other end of England. 
and Holmes was right in his guess. From that day to this, nothing has ever been heard of the beautiful woman, the cruel German, or the bad-tempered silent Englishman. Early that morning, a farmer had met a cart containing several people in some very large boxes. They were driving fast in the direction of Reading, but the criminals left no further signs, and even Holmes failed to discover any clues. We learned that the fireman had found a human thumb, recently cut off, at a window on the second floor of the house. At about sunset, they succeeded in putting the fire out, but by that time the roof had fallen in and almost nothing remained of the forger's machinery inside the house. Large amounts of different metals were found in a building behind the house, but it was clear that the criminals had taken their stores of forged coins away with them in the boxes. The mystery of how Mr. Hatherley had been carried from the garden to the roadside was quickly solved when Holmes found a double line of footprints in the soft earth. The engineer had been carried out by two people, one of whom had very small feet, and the other unusually large ones. On the whole, it was most likely that the silent Englishman, less fearless or less cruel than the German captain, had helped the woman to carry the unconscious man out of the way of danger. Well, said Hatherley a little sadly, it has been a strange affair for me. I have lost my thumb, and I have lost fifty pounds in pay. And what have I gained? You have gained experience, said Holmes laughing, and you have now got a true and interesting story of your own, which you will be able to tell every day for the rest of your life.